Well, I don't know if you've heard, but the end is near. You've heard this before, or maybe seen people holding signs that say the end is near before, haven't you? When I was a student at U of A, there was someone who would preach on the mall uh, periodically saying something to this effect. Of course, we didn't really listen to him. There's a story of two pastors that were from some lo- couple local churches in the community, and they were standing by the side of the road, and they were holding uh, these signs, and the signs read, The end is near. Turn yourself around. Before it's too late. They were standing on the side of the road, and their, their objective was to make sure that the, the drivers of the cars saw them and would respond to the signs. Well, the first car came up, and the driver yelled out his window, Leave us alone, you religious nuts! And he sped by, turned the corner, and then they could hear the screeching of tires and then a big splash. One pastor said to the other, well, do you think maybe we should just put up a sign that says the bridge is out instead? (laughs) Because it depends on what you're thinking of when you say that the end is near. Last week, we began our uh, reading of the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And Pastor Andy got us started, and he reminded us how important our witness is as we explain in word and deed and live who Jesus is in our lives. And also he reminded us that it's important to remember in terms of the times and timing of things that we don't necessarily know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, right? And so today we're continuing in reading this uh, difficult chapter of Jesus' words to us. Now it's Lent. We ought to be expecting difficult words from Jesus in this season. Words to remind us about what is true, about the bad news of our sin, but the good news of his grace and mercy. And so we are reminded about, or he is telling us about the destruction of Jerusalem and then the coming of the Son of Man in the end days. So let us hear God's word. I'll be reading this morning from the ESV version, which might be different than what you have with you. But it begins. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days. I'm just going to pause there. Uh, Jesus doesn't have anything in particular against Pregnant, or nurse, pregnant women or nursing mothers. It just so happens that they are very vulnerable when bad things happen in catastrophes. So I'll continue. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jer- Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles till the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, Straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, 
lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place, to stand before the Son of Man. And every day he, Jesus, was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and lodged at the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning all the people came to him, in the temple to hear him. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we give you thanks for this reading of your word. And we pray now, Lord, that you would come in power to teach us and to correct us, to help us, oh Lord, in our thinking and in my words. Lord, may we hear your word, correcting, leading, that we might give you glory in all of our days. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So this past week, uh, my uh, wife and kids had some days off for spring break, and so we spent some days together, and, and invariably what happens, uh, we get a piece of furniture that needs put together. That tends to be what we do when we have a day off. And so there was a bookshelf that we got, and it came in a box, and it was all tightly packed. Have you done this before? All very, t- very tightly packed, all of the, the boards and the wood and the, and the, the, the different things. But then I, f- I saw it. Okay, I saw it. The red envelope. I saw this red envelope. And I thought, oh, that's important. It's as if I've won an award or something. Maybe my Grammy acceptance award is in here or something. Like that. But then I thought, no, it's instructions. It's in three different languages, but I could kind of make out what it means in the other languages. You know, it's got French, I don't know how to pronounce it, but directives, kind of, kind of English-like. Instrucciones in Spanish. This is what I need to follow, right? To put the bookshelf together. And so you open it up, and I realized that, that these words on the front of the envelope were the last words I, would go, I was going to read. Because they're just pictures. Pictures about where A, A, B goes on step 17 with the, with, the, with the 4X, and yeah, page after page of diagram that you're not sure if it goes this way or that way or this way. And I know how people are. You know, they say there are two kinds of people when it comes to instructions. Those people that follow them and follow them carefully, and those people that do that. Who are you? You know who you are, don't you? When you see a big pile of instructions, are are you there? Is it for you or is it for someone else? God's word comes to us today with a set of instructions. Are they for us or are they for someone else? This season of Lent, we do a deep dive into God's word and to prayer, that we might be formed, reformed, prepared for the truth of what it means that Jesus dies for us and is raised for us. John Stott, in his book, Authentic Christianity, the evangelical theologian, he writes, we need to repent of the haughty way, he's British, so he uses the word haughty, we need to repent of the haughty way in which we sometimes stand in judgment upon Scripture and must learn to sit humbly under its judgments instead. If we come to Scripture with our minds made up, expecting to hear from it only an echo of our own thoughts and never the thunderclap of God's, then indeed he will not speak to us, and we shall only be confirmed in our own prejudices. We must allow the Word of God to confront us, to disturb us, to disturb our security, to undermine our complacency, and to overthrow our pattern of thought and behavior. Well, that is what God's word is to do. It is to disrupt us, but not just to leave us disrupted, but that we would be reformed and formed together by the Holy Spirit into the person, the man, the woman, the child, the teenager, the young adult who God wants to create in you. 
the good news in light of the bad news is that God graciously provides everything we need for our salvation. That Jesus Christ in his life, in his obedience, in his teaching, in his death on the cross, in his grave, in his resurrection, through his graciously removing our sins from us, through his graciously putting upon us his righteousness, Christ does everything we need for our salvation, both for today and forever into eternity. And that is the powerful and good news. But we must dwell a bit in the in-between as Christ's church in this world. Because we realize that we live in an in-between time. You see, the Bible talks about times long ago. Is it just that the, we have a, a Bible that's really old and we serve a really old God with no relevance for today? No. No, the Bible teaches us about a God who is eternal, who is as fresh and real and new today as ever. And the Bible also points us to a future, a certain hope. Now, do we understand every bit and criteria about that future hope and when it will come and what it will look like? No, we don't. Even the scripture says, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But we can continue to follow and look to the instructions that we are given about the end. Now, as we look at uh, Jesus' words to us today in Luke, I think there are pointing at two events, and sometimes it's a little bit confusing. One event is the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, which did occur in A.D. 70. And we can see that this, in the predictive sense, is very clear of what happened. So Jesus is saying this is going to happen, and it happened, very similar to the way Jesus said it would. It was the Romans surrounding the city, the Jews and Christians escaping, and being spread throughout the Roman Empire. But then there's another event that's referenced as well, and that is the final judgment the final judgment of Christ's return at the end of time. This is something that's referred to throughout the Bible, and it's promised to us. And this is when we can't really figure out what the date is or what the, the situation will be. Although, this passage tells us what the signs will look like. Now, you realize that uh, every generation has looked at these signs and said, oh, we're in it. Does it mean we're not in the end times? No, it doesn't mean that. Because we're told to be awake and to pay attention. But just take a look at some of this again. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars. Now, at the beginning of this year, I don't know if you're paying attention to the news, but this year we have a lot of astronomical, astrological things that are happening with the planets and the, and the, and the moon and the stars and all the kinds of stuff this year. That for an astronomer, it's a fun stargazing year. Does that mean we're in the end times? I'll continue. And the earth, there's distress of nations in perplexity. Well, that's happening. Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. Well, is that a reference to the global, you know, sea levels rising? Or does that mean we're in the end days? People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. Yeah, people are afraid and fleeing and... There's a lot happening. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And it is true that there is a cosmic battle happening. And it can seem very scary for us to know, is this the last day or not? And this has created a cottage industry of sorts in Christian circles about trying to identify when the last days might be. And you might remember there was a pastor named Harold Camping who just a couple of years ago had predicted in 2011, sometime in May, that it was going to be the last day. Do you remember that? And uh, then May came, and he realized that it wasn't right, and so he, uh, he changed the prediction for later in the year in October. Well, I, I remember there were people talking about it at the time, and I think it was Conan O'Brien that observed it this way, that, uh, that the pastor has, was kind of down, he was discouraged, but his friends came around him to encourage him, even though he'd gotten the date wrong, and they told him, well, 
you know, it's not the end of the world. The instructions from Jesus, though. Remember the instructions. Can I get back to the instructions? I threw them out over here somewhere. Um, he says, watch yourselves. In these days, and I want to be able, I want to say that every day we ought to live as if it is the last day. And that we are held accountable for what our response is to Jesus Christ and his offer of grace and salvation. That we ought not put off the opportunity to receive him as our Savior and Lord. And we also, not off, we also ought not put off a commitment to grow in our faith, to read our Bibles and, and to pray, as, as the passage tells us. We're told to watch ourselves, lest your heart be weighed down. There's a lot of weighing down of hearts I observe these days. There's a lot of hurt and brokenness and sadness and tragedy Except that it's not just circumstantial, it's about the kind of uh, weighing down of our hearts that we bring on ourselves. He says, don't weigh, let your hearts be weighed down with dissipation. It's kind of a weather term, I think. You know, like the clouds are going to dissipate as the day goes. Well, what does it mean to dissipate your life? That, that you would be of substance and then suddenly you would evaporate into nothing by virtue of your worry? It actually, in the Greek, it is a Greek term, dissipation in the English, it's a Greek term for a hangover. Don't be weighed down by your headache with drunkenness, the cares of this life. And then that day would come suddenly upon you like a trap. It's not that God is wanting to trap us or it says that God will trap us. It's that the day will come and it will come to everyone on the earth. Don't let the cares of this life, the distractions of your devices, don't let your hearts be weighed down by all of the distractions around you. Now, I was driving to a meeting this past uh, Friday. It was downtown, and I, and I drove down 4th Avenue to get there, and uh, it was St. Patrick's Day. And there are a number of Irish, pu Irish pubs on 4th Avenue, and I do not have anything against Irish pubs. You need to hear me there. But they were getting ready for a party. okay? Let's just say that. They were putting up fencing, they were putting up extra stages and bands. Apparently they were going to do a lot of Irish dancing, I don't know. Uh, actually, I saw a sign that said, after three beers, everyone's Irish. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, that St. Patrick was talking about when he went to Ireland to convert uh, the, the Celts to uh, Christianity. See, St. Patrick was one who was driven to share the love and provision of Jesus Christ with people who were very different from him, different tribes and different language. And, he, and they received him. And they were brought into the kingdom of heaven because of his work. Yet our hearts can often be weighed down. We can be very distracted in this life. You see, it's very easy to focus on the cares of this world because they're ever before us. They're right there. They, they hold on to us. They cling to us. They, they hurt us. They, they're constantly reminding us who, that they're there. It's much more difficult to focus on the things of God, the spiritual things of God in this life. Yet we are told to stay awake. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength. Stay awake. Literally, does this mean you have to never sleep? No, it's not what it means. But it's just saying, stay awake in your life. Be aware. God is up to something. Are you perceiving it? Praying. Are you praying? Are you seeking strength to battle those things that are tugging on you, weighing down your heart, pulling you into the cares of this world? 
praying that you might have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The verb here, to stand, is interesting in the Greek. It's an aorist passive, which if you're a language person, you might be interested in that. It's a passive, meaning that we're not going to stand in our own strength, but it is the Lord who will bring us to standing. Eugene Peterson puts it this way in the message. Pray constantly that you will have the strength and wits to make it through everything that's coming, to end up on your feet before the Son of Man. You see, God has a whole lot to do with our strength and whether we'll be able to follow his instructions and stand in those days. Are we able to stand today? Are we able to stand in the end? But what does this mean for the church? What does it mean for believers in the church? Well, I think it means some important things. There's some important practicalities about this. And one of my heroes, Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary and then a teacher, he taught a lot about what the church ought to be doing in these days. And he talked about the church living in the midst of history, that we are in the present with the past, but also a very, very important future, not ever forgetting the future calling us forward, that the church lives in the midst of history as a sign, as a foretaste, and as an instrument of the reign of God. Well, I have a sign here. The sign that the church ought to be in the world isn't so much saying that the end is near, because that's kind of a scary message. That's kind of like saying, okay, you know, turn your ears off, because then we're going to tell you something. Actually, the sign that the the church ought to be using is a sign of direction, a sign of pointing. You see, a sign like this, in and of itself, isn't very valuable. It's about what it is directing you to and what it is pointing you to. You see, the church in the world is to be a sign to the kingdom of God and to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the king of this kingdom. You see, the church ought never to simply bring attention to itself for its own purposes and for its own glory. But the church always directs the attention to God and to the kingdom that God wants to bring into this world. So it also means... Oh, Newbegin also said that the church is an instrument. Now, we could think of a musical instrument or we could think of a, kind of like a tool. That God, I went into our, uh, our shed and got this really cool hammer and this thing, which looks cool, right? Anyone know what this is? It's a vice of some sort, right? I don't think I'm supposed to put my hand there. Okay. Anyways, it's an instrument. It does something. Instruments do things, right? With a hammer, you want, you want to nail a uh, uh, nail, nail. And with, you, you wouldn't use this on a screw, right? So in the instructions, it says, don't use hammers. Use a screwdriver. Uh, this thing is meant to clamp wood, I think, and you know, keep it glued together so it doesn't fall apart. Every instrument has a purpose. And so what is the instrumental value of the church? Well, The church is God's instrument through its mission to demonstrate to the world what the kingdom of God ought to be like. That God will use the church to bring change to this world. That God uses believers, you and me, to bring this change into the world. And that is something that we can only do if we have a proper view of the end as well as a proper view of the past. And this is my favorite, that the church is also a foretaste. Kind of like an appetizer. The church, in the way that we learn to live together as human beings, sinners who are in need of God's grace, people from every nation, tongue, tribe, culture, bringing bringing together, learning how to live with one another in love and peace and unity, relying on God's grace, that when the world could see that, that that would be the most credible witness to the world of what the kingdom of God would be like. And it would be like a little appetizer, a little snack before the main event. Now, I like pretzels. You might like something else for for appetizers, you know, maybe hors d'oeuvres of some kind. But the church is not the main meal, but we are simply an appetizer to the world of the main meal that is coming when Christ returns. Friends, this is good news. 
that we have a use, we have a purpose, we have a calling, and we have a God who loves. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we give you thanks that you call us to follow you and that you warn us and that you give us instructions just as a loving brother or sister would, just as a loving parent would. But Lord, as as disobedient children, help us to not just ignore your instructions. Help us to take to heart what it means, the truth that you came and lived and were crucified and you were resurrected and that you will come again. Lord, that we would set aside all of the distractions in our lives to not be weighed down with the cares of this world, but that we would be motivated and propelled, Lord, by your good grace and love and mercy. That we would point to you who is greater than us. That the life of this church would point to a a reality in this world that is greater and way beyond us. That you would enable us to be used by you as an instrument of your goodness, as a foretaste of that feast which is to come. Lord, that we would take joy in any kinds of difficulties that would um, make it hard, that we would need to rely on our faith even more. And Lord, there might be even some today who are considering God, but who have not really made a commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So Lord, help each one of us to take a bit of a step closer to you this day. Enable us by your Spirit, with as much as we know about ourselves and as much as we know about you, Lord, to just step forward in faith, to live for a purpose beyond us, to seek your kingdom in this world, to stay awake, to pray for strength, and to discover joy. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.